One of the squares on the Horror Mayhem bingo card that I downloaded, and I'll put links to all this stuff in the um, description, is animal horror. These are different suggestions you can uh, have you, that are made uh, for different uh, books you can read during Horror Mayhem, the event that I'm going hard on. This month I read two paperbacks from hell that qualify for this. First I read The Pack by David Fisher and I also read The Nest by Gregory A. Douglas. They're both a lot of fun. They're both have some of the common uh, traits of their era. Um, definitely, the pack especially, I think probably both of I them, mean, this is definitely a Jaws cash-in. Like the, I think uh, people out there were writing, uh, were trying to figure like, how do I make as much money as Jaws did? And this book, I don't remember which is which now, because I'm not good with geography, but this one and the other one both take place on islands uh, where people uh, spend the summers for vacation, which annoys the people who live there uh, year-round. You know, I don't know, Cape Cod, Montauk, Long, I, you know, I, the places have various names that... Uh, you know what I mean. The same kind of place that I guess the Jaws takes place. The pack is the pack is fun. It's a pack of dogs who uh, apparently this guy David, according to the introduction, both these novels have introductions by Will Erickson, the co-author of the paperback from Hell book that started this whole uh, revival of, re of uh, appreciation of the 70s and 80s horror boom era paperback originals. According to the introduction, um, David Fisher saw a notification or a, a, a post on the island uh, where he was either living or staying uh, saying, hey, idiots, don't leave your dogs don't abandon your animals at the end of the summer which apparently a lot of people do and uh, happens a lot in Albania actually a lot of uh, ex expats quote unquote come over here they see the wild dogs on the street they adopt the dogs for a while then they abandon them when they leave and there are a lot of there are organizations here in Albania that you can um that'll help neuter these dogs and find a home for them and, and things like that, but some people just abandon them, uh, which is unfortunate, because um, maybe the dogs would have been better off if they'd never had a few months inside to be played with by people who weren't able to commit to them. Um, did I cut this? this? is annoying. All right, so, um, and... Uh, and it's it's a fun book. It's, it's, it moves very fast. It's a very easy read. Uh, where this this pack of dogs uh, of abandoned dogs gets together and becomes a wild pack menacing people on the island um, and hijinks ensue. Um, there's a very funny scene I remember uh, where someone's uh, explaining. There's like a know-it-all character who's explaining how you know pack packs the dogs who are you know dogs don't really pack together. They don't really learn how to become pack animals again. Uh, once they've um, once they've gone feral like this, which you know is my experience too of countries where there's a lot of street dogs and things like that, and it's a sad situation. But in in the in the book, it's uh, it, it's it's uh, it makes makes for fun a terror novel uh, of the Jaws type. Then it is uh, overshadowed though by the Nest, this Gregory A. Douglas novel which is much better written. They're both fun to read if you like animal horror, and I, I can't say that I've really read a lot, although I thought of two famous ones that I know about, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But The Nest is really gross and really well written because it's about these, uh, this, it's about rats and cockroaches together everybody's most disgusting thing. It's a pretty disgusting book. I really hate cockroaches. I really hate insects of any kind. But I knew what I was getting into from the cover. Uh, 
you know, there's a giant gross cockroach. It's like, there's nothing more disgusting to me than insect horror and insects. I really hate them. I know some people kind of think they're cool, but I'm just um, not one of those people. But it's, uh, it's very fun to read. I wanted to read this section here. It gives us... Uh, so you've got a couple kids here who are kind of watching these rats through a spyglass. Rebecca shouted back through the trees, Amos is going to chase them away. They're, they're looking at these rats. But she skidded to a halt at the sight of which her sister was pointing in horror. Let's see if I can read this. In this elevated section of the woods, the ridge was only sparsely covered on a stony ledge before the girls and the wind-blown pines were dwarf size and twisted like Japanese bonsai. The, op the open platform was swarming with rats. They were large, fat brutes, disgusting with their swollen bellies, narrow rodent faces, and snaking tails. They That was revolting enough, but the freaky spectacle was the dance the rats seemed to be doing. One after another, rats leaped into the air. Their thin legs kicked wildly, their long tails whipped madly there. Heads jerked from side to side in the macabre ballet. Scores of rats were in the air at one time, colliding, snarling, snapping with squeals of fury. In their berserk acrobatics, many rats flung themselves off the cliff as if their maddened brains imagined they could fly like birds. They plummeted to their death in the sea below to be scavenged and quickly gathered by quickly gathering fish and birds. But that's not even the part I wanted to get to. Let's get out of here, Ruth trembled. Rebecca had her binoculars up. This, she screamed in surprise and horror. It's roaches, roaches, Ruth said, incredulous. Cockroaches, millions of them. Great, big, King Kong cockroaches. What are you talking about? Big cockroaches all over the rats. All right, so you can see it's just like tear on top of tear. It's very vivid writing. It's really effective and fun. Um, so if you're going to read one of these, I'd recommend that one. It's it's longer. Um, it's more involved. Uh, it's more thought out. Um, or if you just want a quick read, read the pack. Uh, I recommend them both. It's a fun way to spend a couple afternoons if you want to read really sleazy 70s horror this is the stuff i believe the nest was the first paperback from the first according to it was listed as paperback from hell number one i don't know if they really number them anymore so i think it's the first one they put out um if you're curious about this kind of stuff i'd read that one then you'll know whether they continue or not and if it's and if you're grossed up by disgusting stuff the rat the nest is probably gonna gross you out And as I was saying a minute ago, um, I hadn't really never read any animal horror that I could remember, but of course, this brought back memories of a couple things that I did read. Of course, the big, probably the most famous animal horror story of all time is Jaws, which I read when it came out. It's one of the first books I remember reading before I saw a movie, before a movie was made, actually. And... The one thing about Jaws, and I, I don't think I'm alone in saying this, is that the book is not as good as the movie. The, the movie is great. They change a lot. They, as my uncle said, who took me at the time, was like, boy, they sure cleaned that story up. Because there's a lot of sex in uh, Jaws. Because it was, it was of the era. It was uh, written to be a bestseller. I think it's only... It's pretty short. I probably... You know, they did it with like big print and big margins and stuff, so it looked like a fat bestseller. But I think probably if, if you did it as a category mystery book, it'd be like 175 pages, Jaws would. I could be wrong. Um, the, the middle third of that book is just a big uh, sex scene between um, the chief's wife, Brody's wife, and the who in the movie is a Richard Dreyfuss character, has really nothing, and Brody never even finds out about it, has really nothing to do with sharks, or has nothing to do with the setup, has nothing to do with the final third of the book. They just cut all that out. That was really the 70s, though. You had to have, like, um, in those kind of bestsellers, you, you had to have sex. So the movie's stronger without having that, even though I'm not against... Um, 
that in principle, and I never read any other Peter Benchley, and I, I think that's true of most people on Earth who read Jaws. Uh, some of his other books sound kind of interesting. Island sounds pretty interesting, um, which is about the descendants of pirates who have this civilization in a, on an island in the Caribbean, and they terrorize some whoever, you know, yacht goers or something. So there's that, and then another one that re this reminded me of. Well, there's another one that's mentioned often in the when you talk about horror, uh, animal horror, the '70s, and that's the Rats by James Herbert. Hope I got that name right, which I've never read, and I don't have a copy of, so I'm still not going to read it. But I would like to read it. Another one that was a big part of my childhood was uh, called Ratman's Ratman's Notebooks. Uh, which was ba which the movie Willard was based on, and I was obsessed with that movie. I saw Willard and Ben when they came out in the theaters. I don't remember if I saw Willard and then Ben when it came out on a double feature with Willard again, or if I just didn't see them until <coughs> until they came out with Ben. I remember Ben. No, I okay, now it's come back to me that I saw Willard because then I found the book, which was called Ratman's Notebooks, and I'm looking for the cover here so I can credit the author. Um, I, I thought I had a... Oh, here it is. Stu, Stephen Gilbert, Ratman's Notebooks. And I don't know, I probably had a... Had a uh, I probably read a movie tie-in of it. Uh, the, the movie with uh, great cast, Bruce, Bruce Davidson, who's you know still working today in tons of stuff uh, as a character actor. Uh, this was a lead role when he was a young man. You know he's in tons of Star Trek. He's in all kinds of stuff. Bruce Davidson. He works all the time. Uh, he might have just retired. I don't know. Blonde, uh, slender, blonde guy. He's in a really. Good, he's in Uzala's Rage. I think. Is that the movie? He's, uh, I think that's the oldest thing I've seen with him, with Burt Lancaster, and he plays a smarmy, like, you know, uptight, cow, young cavalry officer who doesn't know shit, and, and of course, Uzala, and, you know, Burt Lancaster's the crusty old Indian fighter, scout guy who has to teach him, you know, um, what life is like on the West, and, and, uh, um, that's a good movie that I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so I got the, I got the book of Willard, and uh, you know, even at a young age, I was always like looking at the table of contents and the copyright dates, and a lot of times these old paperbacks they would put like the uh, the copyright in Roman numerals to try and disguise the fact that the book was 20 years old or whatever. Although this was uh, this was published in '68, and so. Okay, and then the film was made only three years later, and the sequel, Ben, was made in uh, 1972, and then, of course, there's a remake that I've never heard of and probably nobody's ever watched that, you know, 10 years ago. It's like, you know, when you look up Total Recall or something and you find out there's a... <laughs> there was a remake that's completely forgotten. Um, but maybe people like that one, too. It's, it's with... Um, Crispin Glover, which seems like a good choice. Uh, anyway, Ratman's, Ratman's Notebooks. I read about this guy, Stephen Gilbert, here. He had a very interesting life. He lived to almost age 90. Now, I would have guessed, apparently there's a Valancourt Books um, a version of Ratman's Notebooks uh, introduced by Kim Newman. I've never really seen that one in any of my browsing or anything. So that was about 10 years ago they put this out. It's, as the title would suggest, it's uh, done in the form of notebooks by this weird young man who it, who collects these rats, and they're his friends, and he lives at home with his mother, and his mother's a lunatic, and got an awful job, an awful boss. Uh, and the book is told in the story of, in the, in, you know, as, as notebooks that he's writing about this stuff and how 
you know, he's anthropomorphizing the rats. He's got his two favorite rats are, are Socrates, which is kind of the good rat, and and Ben, who's kind of the the angry rat. Um, this plays out in the movies. Socrates is a little bit like Cornelius in the Planet of the Apes films, and Ben is more like uh, Caesar, I guess. Um, speaking of Planet of the Apes, which I often do, but I, I enjoyed the book. The book was uh, set in uh, the United Kingdom. I, I see here, I thought it was set in England. I, and it doesn't really say on this Wikipedia page. I haven't revisited this book before today since that Stephen Gilbert was northern was uh, Stephen Gilbert was uh, from Northern Ireland. So I don't know if the book is maybe set in Ireland. I just don't remember. But I remember, you know, of course the movie was set in the United States. Uh, the movie's probably better. It's got Ernest Borgnine's in it as his really horrible boss, Bruce Davis boss and and uh, Sandra Locks in it which is interesting because later she wrote she when she had a very short directing career Sandra Locke wrote and directed a movie about a rat-faced boy I don't know if she was inspired by her time working on Willard um, I do remember th that when the second movie came out Ben which is more of a which is a sequel not based on, on the book, but it's just the, the rat Ben escapes and the rats take over the city and I think Joseph Campanella is a is a cop and there's a really boring-ass Michael Jackson uh, um, theme song called Ben, which you might have heard. Ben! Ben! Um, you know, which is just so tedious. Um, to listen to really boring ballad. Uh, Meredith Baxter is in this too. Anyway, I still remember about that movie that they somehow had to give the, the people information, the cops and stuff information about how this rat infestation is taking over the city. So even though uh, the character Willard is no longer around, spoiler alert, in the sequel, they go... You know, they they find his diary and they read his diary and I doesn't remember thinking he wasn't keeping a diary in the movie. He didn't have a diary, but you know, they decided to you know pretend that it was a sequel to the novel, I guess. Uh, you know, so they could do that, so they could just have a way to explain, so that some so somehow they would know what was going on because Willard is all in the. Um, you know, it's it's Willard the film and and the movie is is very uh, you know uh, small bore I guess you'd call it or something. It's very insular. It just has to do with this this small circle of people, and then Ben is like a big sort of uh, grody uh, action um, movie of the '70s where the rats take over this you know attack everybody in the city and that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a boring movie. Uh, it's not the best, um, but Willard, I would watch Ratman's Notebook. I probably won't revisit it again, but talking about it, I'd kind of like to see what I'd think of it now, but it's probably not going to happen. Anyway, so that's my thoughts overall on the the genre of animal horror. If you know any other good ones, leave them in the comments if you feel like it, or pick up any of these. If you read just one, I'd, I'd, I'd read... The Nest, if you haven't got a lot of time, I would read Ratman's Notebooks. And if you just want something really cheesy and straightforward and no bells and whistles, I would, I would, I would uh, read The Pack. It's also the least gross because dogs are less gross than rats and, and cockroaches.